We'd like to welcome each and every individual to the Entrepreneurial Awakening Movement. Oh my gracious, this is Mark Borsmar. Are you as excited as I am? I don't know. You don't sound as excited as I am. Let me tell you, the awakening, ah, like, it's like my head is exploding. Like, it's like, wow, it's so cool to be like awakened, like at will. Uh, just really awesome. So hopefully you internalize that lesson. Today we're going to be going through, so the four pieces of the Entrepreneurial Awakening Movement, the quantum thinking is awakening, ownership, work, and care. Hopefully you got that down. Today we're going to be going through ownership. If it seems like we're going over a lot of information in a short period of time, the reason it seems that way is because we are. Um, think about two other people that should be going through this course with you. So who are two other people that should be going through this course with you? Um, why is taking ownership so powerful? And again, Tom and Nicole and Keith, you guys can interrupt me at any time um, when you have a thought or idea. You know, this the recording has started. Please note that your storage is almost full. So and when we Please look at when we look at going through all of this, it's from very account. very important to be able to understand um, it's very very important to understand that like it is the quantum thinking world and so it's going to be going through um, like there's going to be so much coming at us but that's okay because that's how entrepreneurial you know that's how entrepreneurs think like they're always overwhelmed but it's good overwhelmed they're always like crazy so it's like this movement, the Entrepreneurial Awakening Movement, is because of you. Like, you have so much power inside of you. Like, I have six grandkids. They're all entrepreneurs. Every single one of them are entrepreneurs. I think every child's an entrepreneur, and then somehow our educational system or our society or something trains it out of people, which is, you know, really a shame. So we've gone through the history and power of quantum thinking, um, this is very different than formal education because in formal education, all you got to do is kind of remember enough to get through the test, and then you can forget most of what you learned. This is different. Like every one of these lessons will help you in you know all areas of life and going through it. So we talked about the last time, you know, um, the Grandpa Chappelle principle and being able to go through that. Um, and so, are you applying that? you know, that natural law on a regular basis. Tom, you know, you were just a young man at the time. Why do you think you internalize that and most people don't? Uh, I, I, I think it really had to do with my grandfather. He was, he was just a quiet, very methodical type guy. Was, and any time he ever said anything, I always kind of listened to him. I mean, he, you know, he, He's the kind of guy that took me out and taught me how to fly fish and, you know, how to look for the places and how to, a little thing like when you're putting your fly pole together to rub the, the joint right next to your nose because there's a little bit of, you know, oil that's there so it makes it easier to go in and out. So it was those kinds of things. So I just, it was like, I got to listen to this guy. Wow. Wow. And and what's interesting, Tom, is you do that to everybody I've ever met you with. You know, ever anytime we're around, it doesn't matter their age, their ethnic, their gender. It doesn't matter their educational background. Like somehow it seems like you listen to everybody like you did your grandfather. Um, did he teach you that or did you just learn that or why, what's going on there? Well, I think it's probably a combination of my parents and, and him. Um, he was just a, a unassuming individual. And, um, yeah. Nice. I mean, he, and he, was, he had a very dry sense of humor. Uh, and, I don't know, we just, we just connected. Nice. So here's a good question. Does our current educational system teach and reward taking action 
and producing results, or does it reward head knowledge, which makes us feel smart, pumps up our egos, um, pumps up our egos and the egos of those who are teaching us? I don't know. I'm not making any judgment, just asking questions. So when we look at ownership, <laughs> what's that? Time? I would make a judgment. I would make a judgment. <laughs> You know, so we learned on awakening that there's pain and pleasure. So the higher the pain, the more awakening there is. In the ownership world, this one here, taking ownership is learned and is really a muscle. It takes discipline. When we do not take ownership, we willingly, often without knowing it, give up control of the outcome, the results, to something or someone else. When we apply quantum thinking, we make dimensional jumps in taking ownership, which changes everything. So groups of people, you can, you can see in groups of people how entire groups are not taking ownership. <laughs> like they're blaming other people for their failure. And I'm not going to name any groups, Tom might, <laughs> but I'm not going to name any groups of people that are doing this. Um, I'm just telling you that if you're part of a group of people, see, entrepreneurs, they're never part of anybody else's group because they know how to do things on their own. They're independent. Countries love entrepreneurs and hate them <laughs> like because... They love them because of the economic gain it brings a country. Like the government knows I can't create all the jobs and I can't tax myself. I've got to have I've got to have people out there, so I've got to have entrepreneurs. So countries love entrepreneurs and hate them <laughs> because you can't control them. Like you just can't. Like you can't be an entrepreneur if you can be controlled. So if you have a struggle in any area of your life where you're not succeeding, it's because you're not taking ownership of it. And so there is an employee that I used to have. He was a computer programmer. His name was Kevin. I won't give his last name, but his name was Kevin. I said, Kevin, you're killing me, buddy. And, oh, by the way, little little ad here. If you know any amazing mobile app programmers or .NET programmers, definitely let me know because I need, I need some who think like an entrepreneur. Like, that's what I'm looking for. Anyways, Kevin says to me, I'm saying, Kevin, you're killing me, buddy. You're up and down and on and off. You're here and there. Like, for crying out loud, Kevin, i got to have you consistent. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, I don't think you're taking personal ownership. And I'm like, uh, really? Um, <laughs> what do you mean? It's like, I don't think you're taking ownership. I said, okay, uh, that's interesting. What percentage of ownership do you think I'm taking? He says, I think you're taking 85% of the ownership. I said, well, that's pretty high. What do you think I should be taking? He said, I think you ought to take 100% because you're the owner. And I thought, and I thought, well, that's so cool. He's absolutely right. What was I thinking? And then it took me five weeks to replace him. <laughs> um, I was sharing yesterday on BWWM, Business Working Without Me, amazing, amazing group of people. Tom's on that one. And I was sharing about when I had, uh, when I was 18 years old, I started a convenience store in a college dorm. Um, in a, a little private, um, you know, little private college, uh, Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa. It's where I met my wife. And uh, started a little um, convenience store, and it was, you know, an honor, honor system. And, like, they were stealing from me. And, I'm, and I'm, I guess I was whining, and, you know, about everybody stealing from me. I'm like, they're stealing from me. Like, these are pastors. You know, GRBC, General Association, Rugger Baptist, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying, hey, they're stealing. They're pastors and missionaries, like future pastors and missionaries are stealing from me. And finally, the RA, the resident advisor, said, Mark, I'm tired of your whining about people stealing from you. It's a business. That's a part of business. 
Like, if you can't handle, close up your business. And I thought, wow, that's genius. Like, I never realized that. Like, he's right. So I wrote, a, I wrote out a sign and said, did you come to... You know, did you come to Bible college to study to be a pastor and a missionary to steal from me? And this theft stopped. See, when we whine about things, when we blame other people, you know, we don't go ahead and, you know, we don't go ahead and learn things. Um, another story, this amazing story, is, you know, I had worked for two and a half years with a CPA, and, and he had an agreement, I had an agreement, we were partnering up with stuff, and he bailed on his agreement. Oh, by the way, if you know any CPAs that don't think like CPAs, one of, my, one of our clients is a CPA, my oldest brother is a CPA, um, he's like, why do you work with CPAs? He's like, good question. I roll my eyes, I'm like, my gracious. Anyways, if you're a CPA or you know any CPA that thinks like a business owner rather than an, um, you know, an employee, let me know for sure because I'm looking for those. Anyways. So after two and a half years of work, the guy bailed on me. Like, he bailed. He's like, and I guess on one of the calls I was on, this was maybe 10 years ago, um, I was a little, you know, discouraged or something. So I said, you know, Tom said, hey, you seem a little discouraged. I'm like, yeah. Um, you know, I lost, you know, I lost a partner, you know, a CPA. He quit. He's like, okay, so why are you frustrated? Why are you discouraged? I'm like, well, because I spent two and a half years with him, Tom. And I did my side, and he didn't do his side, and I lost all kinds of time and money. And he's like, okay, so why are you frustrated and discouraged? And I was a little ticked at him, a little frustrated. I'm like, Tom, like I raised my voice. <laughs> Tom, like do you not understand? Two and a half years I wasted it, flushed it down the toilet. Like he screwed me. It's like, ah, sorry for the length. He, like it's messed, like it's just, like do you not understand? And he paused, and he's like, Okay, so why are you frustrated? And after a couple more times, I finally said, Tom, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, what do you mean? He's like, well, was it a good idea? I'm like, yeah, it was a great idea. He's like, are there other CPAs out there? And it hit me. I'm like, oh, my gracious. Okay. So I, rather than taking, when we take ownership of things, when we take ownership of things, a magical things happen. It's just absolutely amazing what happens. Okay, so entrepreneurs are able to connect the dots, but they don't know how to teach other people how to do that. And it's through questions, listening, quantum, quantum question, quantum listening, quantum seeing, quantum understanding our own intentions, other people, thinking, capabilities that internalize, that help us to do things, that then produce the results. And then it produced, then it connects into the DNA for people, DNA for business, and then DNA for life. And so that's what the quantum thinking model is all about and being able to go through that. We've gone through the awakening, now we're going through the ownership. These all interconnect. You, you wanna go through the lessons more than once because there's so much there, right? And so when we look at Ownership, we need to internalize ownership. How do we do that? We've went over this before. Ask questions, create an awakening. Listen to the why. Do you know your why? Have you discovered your life vision? Go through Life Masteries Institute. Uh, join EC2. They'll help you understand your why, your life vision. And then seeing new things gives us insight. Then intention purify, purifies us in our intention. And then we go ahead and think differently, radically differently. That gives us new capability, which gives us leverage, which then helps us to internalize, which helps us to change. When we change, we become a delta. What is a delta? Uh, Joe Reed told me, Mark, you're a delta a number of years ago. I'm like, what's a delta? He says, I could drop you anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, and everything around you would change. Why? Because I'm changing so much. That leads to do. That leads to failure. <laughs> then we get it, you know. And we have an awakening. What is that awakening? As we learned in the previous lesson, it's I'm not that smart. I'm not that busy. I'm not, you know, I am not that good at taking personal ownership. So people think I'm really good at taking personal ownership. Maybe not as much as we think we are. I don't really work that hard, and I don't really care that much about people. And again, if you find yourself resisting these things, it's because you're not in the quantum world. That leads to awakening. Now, let's take a look at this. This is really cool. 
Um, most people, it seems, have a hard time pay, taking ownership for their own actions, much less taking the personal ownership for the actions of others. So let's take a look at something really cool, dimensional ownership in its simplest form. Taking ownership for, first, my own choices and consequences. So with our seven kids and now our six grandkids, we teach them at, like, birth. Good choices, good consequences, bad choices, bad consequences. Even our young grandchildren understand. Before they can form sentences, they understand, I make a good choice, I clean my room, I pick up my toys, I don't bite. <laughs> like, like, good choices, good consequences. And so it's so cute to be around them. If you just say good choices, they'll say good consequences. They can't even say consequence, but they understand the concept at the age of, I don't know, one one and a half, seriously, it's very young. So you'd think adults would know how to do that, mm, maybe not. The second level is the choices made by others I lead and I'm responsible for. So I can't tell you how many leaders, managers I've had and their people they're leading, they don't take ownership, they blame the people they're leading. What's well, the people I'm leading? Aren't you leading it? The next level is the choices of those I'm in groups you know, with. So the groups I'm in. So I was raised a very devout Christian, although most Christians don't like me, especially devout ones. Um, and so, you know, the group I'm in, a Christian group, I'm in that group. They don't like me. Why? Because I don't, because I tell the group what I see, you know, about them. And when you tell the group that you're in, and most people are afraid of doing it, an entrepreneur is not. I'm not afraid of telling white males over 50 they're sloppy, lazy, and disciplined, pathetic. You know, they just are. I don't have a problem telling a group that I'm in because I'm not afraid. I don't have a fear of being ostracized by that group because I'm an entrepreneur. I create jobs. I create economic activity. I create wealth. I create new ways of thinking. I solve problems. You know what? <laughs> If everybody abandoned me, there's a ton of people out there that are going to want me in their lives because I'm an entrepreneur. The choices of those made by past generations in my family, community, and world, this is complicated. This is not easy. The choices made by others not connected to me in any way, this is, again, I'm still working on these. Like my, you know, my grandparents you know, and then my great-grandparents, like how many generations do I have to go back and take ownership of? I don't know. Tom, questions or thoughts on this? Uh, it's, you know, I, I think that the issue is, is that you, you have to really go through this and then internalize it. And I know you talked about that just a little bit ago, but to me, the internalization, as I've said before, is that once I really believe in it, I may I, I don't even really have to understand it as long as I believe the concept of it. Then I've internalized it. Then my my uh, reactions change, or my you know my outcome change, or my behavior changes. And then when my behavior changes, my outcome changes, and that's what gets me to the result I'm looking for. So what Tom is referring to is the five steps to success. I want something or I say I want it. When, when, when I say I want something, when Tom says he wants something, he said he wanted to be the president of the largest you know, real estate franchise in the world. When he said he wanted it, um, he went ahead and looked at the obstacles, and there were a lot. <laughs> and then he looked at the sacrifices and there were a lot. One of these days, we'll talk to him about maybe sacrifices he made with his family that he, in looking back, he says, I may have sacrificed too much for what I thought I wanted. I don't know. And then decisions that are made and then the do. And so this connects, the, this connects into, you know, all the different things. So the ownership model, so there's four quadrants in the ownership model, ownership of self, ownership of self and others, ownership of groups, and then ownership of uh, strangers. Then there's 10 levels in these. We're born, 
And then we, you know, start to learn that, okay, it's me and somebody else, and then me and more, and then me and a group, and then me seeing that, you know, that the group is something more than even I have, like sacrifice for a group, and then others, and then strangers close, and then strangers far, and then, you know, learning how to, you know, have a heart for the 7.4, 7.8 built plus billion people, and then learning to, you know, have a legacy. Then what's missing in this model that we just put in is, is sacrifice. And so Tom brought me to tears once when he and I were doing another course, and he said in the course, he said, nobody knows the sacrifice that's been made by Mark's wife, Rosanna, and his seven kids. So Tom knew of sacrifice, because sacrifices his wife, his kids made. So he knew, you know, they've made a big sacrifice for other people. And Tom said, every one of us on this call, everyone going through this, they should understand and thank Rosanna and Mark's seven kids. I don't know that anybody did that. Oh, Tom, maybe they did. I don't remember. And so you, you take the five steps to success and you apply this to the ownership model, the awakening model, the work model, the care model, and then something magical happens. Other thoughts, Tom? Uh, no, not at this time. Nicole, Keith, any thoughts either of you have? Yeah, so then, you know, we're talking about taking ownership of obstacles. You gave a really good example with, with the tech guy you did. So then, you know, how do you get out of your own way to begin to take more and more ownership so you can achieve the goals? When your life goals. vision is bigger than death, you get over stuff. So that takes a little internalization there. What's he talking about? I discovered that with my dad. When my dad died, I was at a coffee connection, and I wrapped it up after my wife got the call, and she said, your dad um, just passed, Mark. My mom, so I wanted to run right away to my mom, um, but I didn't. I finished up the meeting, said, hey, my dad just died, um, and so I want to make sure you all are cared for. And then the next week, they all said, that was weird that you cared for us when your mom was sitting at your dad's bedside when he died. That's just weird, Mark. And I said, I just reflex, I said, when your life vision's bigger than death, you get over stuff. So if your life vision isn't that big, well, then you're going to have a hard time getting over stuff. Little stuff in life will trip you up. Make sense, Nicole? Yeah. Other okay. questions, Nicole? No, they're all good. Keith, questions you have? Um, just, just a comment. I thought it was great like when you talked about young kids. You know, so young they they, they kind of understand the concept of you know every everything they do has a consequence. I think you know for us we become all of our experiences and our environment, everything that we, that happens to us, you know, it almost like it skewers that it takes away our ability to, to think as clearly as, as they, as we do when we're younger. So it's like, if we're not, if we're not taught to be aware of this at a young age and to look out for these, these things happening to us, we, we, we fall into the habit of allowing it, like the said, getting in our own way because we develop these belief systems and whatnot based on, everything that happens around us, but we don't have any of these belief systems when they're that young. It's just a simple, you know, you touch a hot stove, it's hot, there's a consequence. And it all changes as we get older because we're exposed to so much. So many stories, so many thoughts flowing through my mind. Nicole, any other questions or thoughts you have? Well, yeah, now with, uh, I know Jonathan was a huge influence, and not just yours, but in a lot of people's lives. And I've heard you tell a bunch of stories of, of this new level of ownership that you've been taking since his, his death a few months ago. Do you view ownership? How are you viewing ownership now? And how do you explain this new level of ownership to others? So 
you know, Jonathan, if his physical life, if his physical body was here, he would say, I take ownership for my death. It's just who he would. He wouldn't blame somebody else. He'd take ownership of it. For me, as his dad, I'm second in line. And I get it. I, I just do. He's my son. And so I need to take ownership for the contribution I made to his death. And I still don't know what that is. But every day I'm going back through when he was born, <laughs> one year, two year, three year, up to 30 years, like I'm retracing his entire life and trying to figure out, you know, where did I go wrong? Where could have I helped him more? And people go ahead and say, Mark, you can't do that. It's like, you don't understand me. I can do it. I mean, that's what entrepreneurs do. They take ownership. Like, I have six other kids. I have six grandkids. There's a whole bunch of people all around the world. So I couldn't save my son, but that doesn't mean I can't save, help contribute to helping my other six kids or my six grandkids or people who are total strangers. Like, and then people that have it happen to them. So I think the reason people don't hear, I was talking to a friend of mine. He said, you know, I don't understand how you do it. This was a few days after his death. And he's like, I don't understand it, Mark. He said, my son committed suicide 12 years ago. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not angry with my son. And I feel massive guilt. And he says, like you, he's only been dead for a few days, weeks, like, and you're like healed. Like I have no anger at all towards him. I have so much pain and hurt, but it's not, it's not bad pain. It's good pain. So this weekend we were watching my three-year-old granddaughter. That's Lily actually when she was younger with Jonathan. She loved him. Like, she got it. She was on the couch a week or so after he died, and she pointed at his picture, and she said, Jonathan's dead. I'm like, yes, he is, honey. And she's like, it's okay. She's three years old. But this weekend, we were watching her on Saturday, and my wife, I'm in the other side of the house, big home, and I hear my wife just crying uncontrollably. I go over, go up there. She's going through, and she ran across you know, his first haircut hair, like, you know, like from his first haircut, all curly. She said, and she just lost it. She's hurting so much. I'm like, where's Lily? And she's like, well, she's down by the kitchen set. And I didn't see her when I ran up her little place set. And I went down and she's cowering in the corner. And I sit down and she's like kind of trembling or whatever. And I'm like, honey, um, are you okay? And she's like, she's, angry and I said did you hear grandma crying and she's kind of angry and she moves around and I said honey you know she's crying because she hurts you know for Jonathan so much and it's okay honey it's totally okay because you loved him grandpa and grandma so we're gonna cry and that's okay because it hurts so much but it's not bad hurt honey we have so many memories and she kind of smiled and she's like he's dead and I said yeah she said I miss him and I said I do too honey and then she came over and she came over really close and got up on my lap and hugged me and I said now I need to go up and hug grandma and grandma and grandpa are going to cry upstairs probably a lot and it's okay honey like it's okay and if you want to be up there when grandpa and grandma are crying, you can. And if you don't, not. But when we're crying, honey, it's not a bad pain. It's not a bad hurt. Like we're not angry with Jonathan. We just hurt. And it's okay because he meant so much to us. And so I think, Nicole, like I was healed 24 hours after he died from a very tragic death, from a brutal death, from my 19-year-old being in the same room with him. And he's still, like, unbelievable. It's all hurt every day, but that hurt is not, doesn't mean I haven't healed. I, I heal, and I have to heal every day. And so I have to take ownership 
and I'm seeking taking ownership. There's other people who contributed to his death, but they did not, they're not taking ownership, which is fine, that's up to them. They won't ever heal. It's their choice. And so, so I think when we take proper ownership, Nicole, not only do we heal, like that's the only way I'm gonna heal properly. Like my 19 year old son, when I share, hey, I could have done this better, I think I should have done this, this is, I've kind of missed this little piece here. He's like, dad, is that proper ownership? I said, I, I think it is. When my 21 year old son, who is very, very close to him, he says, dad, I'm healing, I'm just not sure if I'm healing properly. I'm like, ooh, like what 21 year old knows that? What 19 year old knows that? The gifts that we're giving, being given every day, like Jonathan's more alive now than he's ever been alive. And I think it's because I'm taking ownership, my wife is taking ownership, my six kids are taking ownership. Like all of us, all of us that take ownership, proper ownership, you can take too much ownership, you can take ownership of the wrong things. And so in the end, Jonathan made a choice, I get that. In the end, you know, he was drunk, I get that. He had alcohol, I get that. So. I'm not taking ownership of the things he should take ownership of. If I do that, that's not going to be healthy for me. Does that help, Nicole, or not so much? I think I, I think it does. Yeah. Tom, I know you got to run here. Anything else that you have, Tom, before you take off? No, I'm uh, I'm okay. Cool. So when we look at this, you know, we need to love ourselves, we need to take ownership of ourselves, and then we need to take ownership of the closest, but we need to take ownership, and as a parent, it's really hard. Like, what do you own and what, you know, don't you, especially when you have really, like, tough things like this, and then, then beyond that, and then beyond that, and then beyond that, and then helping other people take ownership. Like, my 19-year-old, he's taking ownership, and I'm okay with him taking some of the ownership because that'll heal him. But in the end, it was Jonathan's choice, I get that. So it's like everybody in the world today and in groups, everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else and blaming everything else. And it's like, that's not gonna work so well for you. You know, it's just not. And so creating the movement, so there is a um, amazing, and you can visit the website, uh, clarity.dnaforsuccess.com forward slash John and you can go to a section um, there and you can make a contribution. There's $125,000 anonymous donors that have given that for matching gifts to raise $250,000 to help people with alcoholism, kids at risk, P, you know, PTSD, borderline personality, mental abuse, you know, uh, you know, mental abuse, mental illness, drugs and other types of addictions, like um, just, it's unbelievable, and it's going through Life Masteries Institute. They're a nonprofit organization. They'll steward that like nobody's business. It's crazy. If you haven't joined the EC2 um, group community, Engineer Clarity community, do that. It's only 20 bucks a month. <laughs> I was cynical when they invited me to join. I'm like, I don't need one more thing in my life, and it's only 20 bucks a month. What do you get for 20 bucks? I just did it. I just said, I'll do it for a month. Um, and I'm telling you, it's changed my life. I am so glad I joined that group. I don't know what it was, a few months before Jonathan died, because that helped me to see things in a different way. And so it, I, it's amazing. So many people. So I'd encourage you to do that. And then you'll be assigned an EC2 mentor and two EC2 buddies that will help you to create your own movement. Or you could be you know, the crazy shirtless dancing man. Or you could be the first follower. Another great course is the personality certification course, 101. Um, Tom and I have been through that, great course. Another course that Tom and I taught was Leverage, the Magical Arts of Positive Motivation and Manipulation. Um, that was really, that's really cool. Another great course Life Masteries has is the Psychology of People. And so you can register for any of those. Those are all great. Next week we're gonna be talking about um, so we went through ownership, or next lesson we're gonna be talking about is work. And so how do I get more done while working less? And dimensional working, it's totally different. It's really, really cool in what it's able to do. 
Um, we're going to go into the Q&A now, and so there'll be a short uh, pause, and then we'll move into that, and those are really exciting times, too. Here we go. All right, we are in the Q&A for ownership. Tom, any other closing thoughts or insights that you have? Um, not now. I might just listen and maybe cool. something will pop up. Cool. Nicole, how about you? No. No, I think I'm good. I've got to run, but, you know, my one word for this would definitely be inspiring. Um, and why? It's a pretty cool lesson. <laughs> because it makes you think about something in a different way, especially when we talk about getting in our own way and you're view of ownership now with Jonathan Jonathan, and how to maneuver through experiences this way is very, it, it makes you think, and I feel like if a lot of people change their outlook on, on ownership and, and not necessarily a blaming, but just understanding that no matter what it is, you have a hand in it, and imagine if people could accomplish if they thought like that. Right. It's awesome. <laughs> right? Like, 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 we should, like, I want everybody... You know, I want everybody to go ahead and see this because it gives them freedom. Like ownership, you know, ownership doesn't create negative anxiety. Proper ownership does not create negative anxiety, depression, or anything. Proper ownership gives you freedom. It's amazing. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate it. Keith, thoughts that you have? Yeah, you know, kind of on a similar vein. I think, you know, when you when people finally realize how to take full responsibility for their actions and not, you know, look for excuses or others to blame. That's, it's liberating, you know, but until they first do it and understand how it feels to take full total ownership, I, I think, you know, it's a hard thing to do because it's not always comfortable. But once you do it, it's, it's amazing how much liberating and empowering it is and it becomes just a natural part of how you are. It's and been, it teaches others at the same time. It's been so strange to me how people try to convince me not to take any responsibility for it. It's not your fault, Mark. I raised him. He's my son. There are things I missed. A lot of things I caught. So many memories. Unbelievable. And so not only did I lose a, a son, um, but I lost a very, one of my best friends, and I lost an amazing business partner. Like the loss is like, like, oh my gracious. It's so crazy. And I don't know if I could survive this if I didn't have the life vision that I do. Because it helps to give me perspective. You know? And it helps me to see, have so much clarity. Like, just so much clarity. Every day it's like, oh my gracious. I was talking to a pastor, um, who was the pastor that we were attending the church for for the first 15 years, Jonathan from birth to 15 years old. And I said to him, I said, I wish I could have had this kind of clarity without losing a son. But in a way, I haven't lost him. Like, he's more alive than ever. Like, it's crazy how much he's embedded into every part of my brain. Um, Rosanna, you feel that same way too, being his mother. Thoughts, questions, insights you have, Rosanna? Um, thoughts is it's overwhelming. Um, Good overwhelm or bad? Questions. Depends on the day. So it actually depends on your choice. So it's a choice you make every day, every moment of every day, it's a choice you make if it's good or bad. If it's, if it, you feel it's bad, you know, overwhelm, like it's, you can have good ownership, bad ownership, good stress, bad stress, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, good guilt, bad guilt. And so good overwhelm, bad overwhelm. And so if it's bad overwhelm, then you're not seeing something clearly. It's a choice you're making. Does that make sense or not? Yeah. What Tom's thinking is 
is Rosanna just such a lucky, lucky wife to have a husband? Or she does he not understand that she's lost her son? Like, who talks to their wife that directly? Like, wow. Um, I'm sure Tom's thinking she's a very lucky wife um, to have somebody like me. <laughs> um, see, and this is the thing. If I hadn't taken ownership, and oh, I learned ownership. You get this in the back, you know, in the backstage pass. So at 19, Roseanne and I, we were dating when we were 18. At 19, we got engaged. And she had told me when we were dating that her dad had sexually abused her. And um, and I loved him. Like, he, like it was like crazy. And that's when I learned at the age of 19. Well, it took me a couple years to learn it. So it took me 21. Anyways, so I'd ask her questions, and it was vague and kind of weird. We didn't know for 35 years later until that there was disassociation. We thought it had happened for maybe a year, year and a half. Found out 35 years after we got married that it had happened for actually six to seven years, maybe longer. And so, um, like, every time he sexually abused her, the brain, how the brain handles it, is like getting hit in the head with a ball bat. And so, so thankful we found that out a year and a half ago. That really was good because she's healing, doing great. Anyways, so I asked naturally, did it stop? She said it had and stuff. And so I'm like, okay, I, you know, I'm 19 years old, way above my pay grade. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I guess if it stops. You know, I guess I'm a good Christian, so I'm supposed to forgive or whatever. So I did. I'm like, okay, I guess if it stopped, it stopped. Um, and then I'll never forget. It's like all time stood still. Where I was 19, she was 19, we were engaged. And, you know, one time she was over at our house, and one evening she said, Mark, it's started back up again. And we had made a decision to have purity in our marriage or in, in our dating, in our engagement, which was the hardest thing in the world I'd ever done in my life. And and it just destroyed me. Like my mind, um, it just, like PTSD, you talk about trauma, angry, hurt, mad, just so confused. And we kind of worked through that whole situation, made it through that kind of, sort of, but I didn't heal properly on it. So I went into counseling you know, I went into counseling two years later. We were in college. We were poor college students, couldn't afford the counseling. <laughs> and, um, you know, after a few months, I'm like, listen, I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not healing here. And, and he says, well, Mark, it takes a long time with this. Like you, like you're trying to figure it out intellectually and you never will. I have actually. Um, but he told me I never would, which was really helpful at the time. And, um, and I said, well, I've, I've, you know, I've got to heal. He says, well, it's going to take time. I said, I've, I, I can't afford to continue to pay this. Like, I can't afford it. And he says, I, I don't know what to tell you. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to heal quick. And he says, it doesn't work like that. And I said, well, it does for me. And he's like, okay. And I said, so, like, what do you have? <laughs> Give me your best shot. He's like, Mark, you're trying to figure this out intellectually, and you're trying to figure out how you could have prevented it, like take ownership of it. Because I wanted to take ownership. I wanted to say, like, did I, like, what? Like, what's going on? And he says, you just need to accept it and take ownership of the things you need to. And I said, well, what does that mean? So I'm 21 years old. And I said, I said, he said, see, Mark, what you don't, what you under, you got to understand is, you got to understand that if you don't heal from this, if you don't forgive, if you don't learn, if you don't learn how to get past this, it'll destroy your marriage. We hadn't had any kids at the time, but it'll destroy all your kids. It'll destroy your your vision, everything. Well, I didn't. Know, I knew what my life vision was, and I didn't want that destroyed. And I, for sure, I loved her like crazy. And I didn't want it destroying our marriage. And I knew we wanted to have kids, and I didn't want to do that. I'm like, oh. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> so I need to own it. Okay, I will. And I did. And I took ownership of it. And I was 50% healed. Like, I'm like, like I'm 50% healed. I'm like, 
you've got to be kidding. And so, like, it had, like, I was suicidal, depression 24-7. Like, I couldn't, like, my brain was just, and I, and I didn't, you know, didn't drink, <laughs> didn't do drugs, didn't take any medication. I'm like, yeah, I can't do any of that. So I had no place to go but my own brain to heal it. So I'm like, okay. So I was 50% healed. And let me tell you, when you're 24-7 in pain, when you're 24-7 in pain, and you only are 12, <laughs> you know, 7 in pain, like half your day, you're not dying. I'm feeling great. But I'm still, you know, so I go back the next week, and I said, that was amazing, like, taking ownership. That's so cool. Like, like I can take ownership of where I'm at, and I don't, and and I need to forgive, and I did. So I forgave, you know, and so it's like, okay. And I said, and I said, and I didn't realize that until just this instant. I said, I want the other 50%. And he's like, well, it doesn't work like that, Mark. <laughs> and I said, uh, it does for me. And he's like, I don't think so. And I'm like, well, give me your best shot. And he gave me something that I'll reveal, remind me so I don't forget, in, in the caring. I didn't even realize it until now. Like in caring. In the caring lesson I'll revealed, he taught me to take ownership and it healed me 50%. And then he taught me how to care. And I didn't remember, I didn't, I didn't even realize that until right now. Like, oh my gracious, he taught me to care. So I'll give that in the caring. But I told him, so he gave it to me. I'm like, oh my gracious, that'll work. I'm healed. Like I'm 100% healed. And he's like, it doesn't work that way, Mark. I said, it does for me. <laughs> and he's like, um, okay. And he knew. Like, he knew I wasn't going to come back. And he's like, okay, before you leave, Mark, you got to go ahead and understand something. And I said, okay. And he says, like, okay, you're healed now, and you'll be healed for a day, and then it'll come back. Or you'll be healed for a week, and then it's going to come back. Like, it's never, it was so traumatic on you. There was so much trauma on your brain. Like you were hurt so deeply at, at a heart level. You were hurt at a heart level, Mark, that it, you're never going to escape it. It's always going to come back. And so, but it'll get better. Your brain will heal. Like your brain will heal. And I'm like, okay. And he says, so it'll, you know, go maybe, you know, like now you've been, it's only 12, seven, you know, half a day. You're, and so it's going to, you're going to heal. Your brain will heal to where it's only hitting you once a week. I'm like, okay. And then he says it'll be once a month. And I'm like, okay. And then he says it'll be once a year. And I'm like, okay. And then and then it's going to be, you know, once every three years and maybe once every five years. And I'm like, okay. And he says, but it'll never go. It'll be with you forever. And I'm so thankful that he taught, like he taught me that. And so, um, so I had 33 years of training in that type of thinking. And so when I was healed with Jonathan, I knew that it would be a daily thing and I knew that it would be come in and out waves and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm so thankful for that experience at 21 because that's what helped me to heal, to stay healed with Jonathan. And I believe that's the answer to um, PTSD. I, I do. And that's where the mobile app and raising the funds, you know, so even if you can only give five bucks, give whatever you can, like, you know, a dollar, like seriously, give whatever you can, um, because this mobile app, I believe, is going to heal the world. So I believe it can heal from alcoholism. I believe it can heal kids at risk. I, can, I believe it'll heal. And the healing is not going to come from some drug. It's going to come from your own brain, from our own brain, based on our personality. Like it's the coolest thing. Um, and so it's going to heal naturally. The brain, the brain has all of this healing powers within it, but we often um, override it with things that we shouldn't, whether that's alcohol or whether that's drugs or whether that's medication or whatever it is. 
I'm not saying it should never happen medication. I'm just saying, obviously, we've seen recently of the, the downsides where there's more people addicted to prescription than illicit stuff. And my 19-year-old son, he was one of those, um, you know, where he was, you know, bodybuilder, 17, 18, got hurt. And then he went in and took, you know, had prescribed medication and then he became addicted. And so, you know, this hits from all different directions. And so, um, so Life Masteries Institute, I'm so thankful, so appreciative that they've dedicated this course in memory of Jonathan um, and his life because he continues to live, not only in my heart and my wife and my six kids, my grandkids, but in your, each of your hearts because this course would not be here without him. He's the one that helped in so many of these discoveries and helped in so many of these ways. And so I, I can trust Life Masteries Institute, and I own my own company, but I can trust Life Masteries Institute to better than me, better than my wife, better than our family, better than my company even, to um, steward um, everything that Jonathan you know, has blessed us with. And, and then we're going to stop it. Like, we're going to stop what happened to Jonathan. We're going to stop it in other people as many as we can. And for the families that are hurting, like my wife and I, we're going to help them, too, to heal. Like, you can heal really quick. When you understand your personality, you understand some of these natural laws. Oh, my gracious. It's absolutely cool. Um, Antoinette, any questions or thoughts you have? Um, as of now, I don't have pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's really awesome. Keith, any other closing thoughts, questions, anything you have? Nope, I'm good, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Rosanna, anything else you got? No. All right, so going through this, like, is this cool or what? Like, think about two other people. Like, start to care about two other people. Like, I care about the total stranger, you know, that I'll never meet all the way around the world where I don't want them to go through what my son went through and I don't want them to go through what I'm going through, my wife or other people. So care about other people and get people to join and go through this, right? I mean, I get literally, like, I wonder, I do. I wonder if I was just a month, two months, three months, six months ahead of time. Like, I wonder if Jonathan would have gone through this if he'd still be with us. Well, he is still with us, yes, but if he'd be with us in a physical form, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I'm not God. I'm not some pastor who knows everything. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Um, but it's it's cool to me to think like that. Why? Because there's other people that I can help. There's other people that I can impact. And you can, too. By You know, again, it's not the size nearly, but because of the 125,000 matching, if you give $10, it's like giving 20. If you give 100, it's like giving 200. If you give 10,000, it's like giving 20,000. Like, like, it's like giving twice as much. And so it, you know, and who knows that because the mobile app's going all over the world, the 7.8 billion people, I believe it's going to touch every single one of them. They're all going to be exposed to it. I do believe that. And so who is to know that you don't give generously to you know, the, this, and it won't come back and help you personally or help one of your siblings or one of your family members. Like often when we give to outside of ourselves, we don't think it's going to impact us, but it does, and we don't even know it. So hopefully this is beneficial, really cool. Can't wait for the next one work. Like that one's going to be a wild one, and then obviously caring. And then, oh, like this course is crazy. If you have any questions, connect with your um, your mentor, your art mentor, um, or, or anyone else in your art group. Uh, invite other people to participate, and always remember we can accomplish so much more together than we ever could on our own. Have an amazing day. Bye-bye.